So we're going to talk about Barbara's leadership journey to where she is now. And she's going to teach us some wisdom nuggets from her journey. And we're going to ask her some very specific questions about individuals in this room and what she thinks of you. So please make sure you have your notebooks out. I would take my more permanent notebook at this point. You're never going to hear this as you hear it. I really wish I had a recorder so that I could look into this later. But, you know, Barbara, I'm going to be listening. So, Barbara, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. So, my first question to you is, may you please take us through your, your leadership journey. How did you get to where you are at now with Barbara? And please start from your early teens. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I'll begin from when I finished school. I think I, I was in my teens when I was completing Form 5, as we used to call it then. It's grade 12 now. I'm going to university to study for my degree. Um, I finished my education degree uh, to be a secondary school teacher when I was 22. And uh, my first school was a boys' school. And I was the only Zambian teacher at that school because secondary school uh, teachers at that time were from outside the country, they were expatriates. I was telling one Ghanaian come and remember that in fact I taught with Ghanaian teachers, Nigerian teachers, Zimbabwean teachers, wow. even South African teachers, Indian and British teachers. Um, so when I got to my first school, I was the only Zambian teacher that time. And the challenge of being the first and only Zambian teacher at the time was that I had to prove myself beyond the norm. I wanted to show that I could do as well as the expatriates were doing, if not better. And true to my word, I didn't, it didn't take me long before I got promoted to go and become a deputy head teacher um, in a girls' school. And that was after teaching for six years. For, for, for many people, it was a bit strange. For a young woman to, to teach only for six years and get a promotion to the position of deputy head teacher. In fact, one of my primary school teachers came to my office and said, what happened? I'm still a teacher. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she wow. taught me at primary school. Mm -hmm. He was still teaching, but I was already a deputy head teacher. Mm -hmm. And in no time, I became head mistress. Again, the first head mistress at that school, at that secondary school, the first Zambian head mistress at that, at that school. So again, I was taking over from an expert group. So the challenge continued. Um, uh, it was like I was the first at as big as stages. I was the first Zambian inspector of schools on the Copper Belt, uh, in the Copper Belt province, which is one of the biggest provinces. It's still the biggest province. And when I moved to here to Lusaka headquarters, First of all, I worked at the provincial level and then became permanent secretary again at first because I was the first permanent secretary for the Minister of Education to rise through the ranks. Wow. Others came from outside, either because they had political connections or otherwise, but I had no political connections. I rose through the ranks from a notary teacher and I took every stage, head of the department, deputy head, head teacher, inspector of schools, until I became permanent secretary. An achievement that I treasure and I think I'm proud to say uh, that I was able to, to achieve that. Um, Although I was in my 50s when I was, I became permanent secretary, I, but I still think it was, it was an achievement. Phenomenal, yeah. Yes, it was a big achievement and I had to work hard to measure up to that position. Um, as if that was not enough, when I retired, one day I got a, a, a call from State House. Gillian, who was our administrator in Comfort, said, the president would like to talk to you. <laughs> what? <laughs> About what? Which president? President mm. Sack. Hey. <laughs> and what was the message? I was being appointed into foreign service to go and become an Zambia's uh, ambassador to, to, the, to Angola. Mm. So, and 
in most of these positions, I was head hunted. I didn't apply to become um, inspector of school, become PS, become ambassador. And I sometimes ask myself, what is it about me? Because it's just ordinary me that made people notice that, uh, that I was there and that I was able to perform the function that, uh, that I performed. And I thought it was hard work. I think it was hard work. And I'm sure that if you all work hard and one day you'll be rewarded. For your, for your hard work. Um, the, the, the comfort aspect, I think I already spoke about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it was also just by coincidence. I had been invited to, to Zimbabwe to go and attend a comfort function. And I met Aunt Cotton. I don't know. I met mm -hmm. some young women. I met some <laughs> 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 mean, young girls, I should be saying. <laughs> I met young girls. <laughs> I met with Lucy, I met mm -hmm. Angie, and they said we should have a similar program in Zambia. And uh, and said we don't have the money to come to Zambia at the moment, but when we do have the money, we will consider Zambia. And by coincidence, when I was permanent secretary, there was a knock on my door, and a request was made that uh, now company was able to move to Zambia and. Was it the right for them to come? And that's how that's how comfort came. And I said, I know you don't have many, much, much money, so I will give you free space. You okay. get me free office space. Oh. We the second a government employee to come fed, mm -hmm. who was on government pay. You will use our facilities. You can use our telephones. You can use our vehicles when you're going out into the field to visit. And that's how comfort began. A small seed, but look at what comfort is. <laughs> so I think that's good, Barbara is. Um, what did I tell you? Now I want to be Barbara today. There was, there was an understatement. I thought I'm the one with a lot of language. So, you know, you know what? I don't know. I, I, I should have mentioned that Angie and the Noctin came into my office. I, and then I was surprised she was not intimidated by the size of my office. <laughs> I was! I was the office, sitting behind this big desk, and I said, this little girl coming in and... Let, let me let me speak yeah. I'll, I'll just say that very briefly because it's, it's you know it's her that I want us you know to hear here. So when Comfort had just started in Zambia, I think it was like two years or a year there. I was invited to come and do schools monitoring. I think we we're getting our first group of girls into school, and the dad, I think, she was inspector of school, said to me, "Oh, it would be good for you to see you know the permanent secretary, um, you know, but she's very busy. We we don't have time, so we just you know sneak in." I got in the, like, to be honest, you know, when people are prepping you for meeting the boss. So I was like really intimidated, I need to be honest. But when I got to the door, Papa, like, she was kind of like an old time friend. She said, Oh, Angie, thank you for coming. And she hugged me, made mm -hmm. hugs, you know. So I remember, I remember saying, Okay, is she the <laughs> So it was, to be honest, I, from that point on, I went to schools and I knew that, come on, I had met the highest office holder and it was signed and mm -hmm. not shed a blessing. So that's why I keep respecting Barbara every single day because she made me feel very comfortable that day. So um, we can talk forever, right? I want to ask Barbara some of the hardest questions that I know that as leaders we grapple with. So Barbara, throughout this whole journey, have you ever had to make an unpopular decision? And can you think of you know, what that unpopular decision was and how did you make it? Oh, I had, I had to make many unpopular decisions, but I'll share one, one because it really made an, an impact on the work that I do. Um, during the, eight, the 1980s, teachers decided to introduce a parallel program in the schools to raise money. They, they, the intention was good, they, they, they felt they would raise money for, I think, improving facilities in the schools, but also for teachers to get an extra bonus of some kind. So they'll charge, they privately engage students, they'll charge them, but they'll use the same school facilities. In the morning, uh, uh, official students will come, but in the afternoon, they'll have these afternoon classes. I think it is still there. Maybe now it will be discontinued because it, will, it became unpopular mm -hmm. at some stage. Mm -hmm. 
And I had just come from a period when we were improving results in my school. I went into a girls' school where the results were terrible, 30% at grade 12. And I worked hard to raise the percentage to 75%. Wow. And then this program came, and that, that my dilemma was, this is, for the teachers it was a very good thing because they would make extra money. But for the student, for the school, it meant yes. that we would lose the, that quality because it's the same teachers, thank you. It would, it would affect our afternoon programs, no extracurricular classes because they needed all the rooms to teach this new cohort of, of, of students. So it would, it would have affected the quality of our teaching. It would have put pressure on the structures in the school and on the facilities. So I just stood my gun that in this school there would be no afternoon classes. But all the other schools in the in, in Elwansha where I was teaching introduced the program. So you can imagine the backlash. The all the teachers were sulking, they were saying, who did I think I was to stop them from uh, enjoying the benefits of what others are enjoying. So I said, I have a choice between pleasing the 20 or so teachers who are teaching in my school and, and, and affecting the hundreds of girls that were in my school. So I said, well, I will face this. I'll stand by my decision. And there was no APU at much against secondary school during my time. Wow. Wow. So. <laughs> continues to rise through the ranks. Mm -hmm. She continues to put the child at the center. At the center always. All right. Barbara, um, have you ever had to go over and above the call of duty? You had a job description as a teacher, you had a job description as a head teacher, as permanent secretary, as ambassador for Zambia to Angola. Have you ever had to go over and above that job description and deliver way more than it expected you to? I think from my, the experience of being a first in most of my positions, I had to work extra hard all the time to prove that I could do it as well as those that felt they were better than myself. And um, um, what would happen then was um, a lot of pressure uh, coming from all angles. Uh, but then I, 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 I stood my ground and said, I will do extra hard. I will be the first to arrive in the school and the last to leave. And I lived by that all the, all, all the time. And, um, but what I did most, that I still recall, helped the girls that I was teaching was to allow girls to re-enter school after getting pregnant when it was against the government policy. Wow. But how did I do that? Well, I waited until they had their baby, and then I wrote them a transfer as if they were just moving from my school to another school. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I knew that the children of those with connections mm -hmm. and those with money did it anyway. Mm -hmm. They would find their way back into school somewhere because they went and paid someone. But these girls who were in my school would have nobody to speak for them. So I, I just arranged that I would write them a transfer and they would uh, go to another school and continue with their, their education. And I said that it was, I, I was doing that at the risk. I risked my own job, but I knew I would benefit ordinary girls that way. Otherwise, I'm not going to get another <laughs> chance to continue with their education. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky to work with Barbara, so I get to hear a lot from her and get to hear direct from her. I think for me, one of the narratives that keeps coming through is that where there's a will, there is a way. If you care deeply about something, you always find a way to get it done, irregardless. But also going over and above the call of duty means that at times you have to put your job, your own security at risk. And aren't you glad that now there's a policy in Zambia oh, that yeah. allows that? Yes, yes. Yeah, do you want to talk a bit that? about that? <laughs> um, yes, but now officially, girls can go back uh, to school after getting pregnant. Because, not because of my pressure, but because I think the civil society generally in Zambia uh, were fighting uh, for that to happen. But even at that time, I was part of the team that was fighting. I was, I was working for the forum for African women educationalists in Zambia. I was working for them. I was a member of, of Power Zambia. 
I eventually became their chair again by default because I was elected in absentia. I, was, I think I was traveling abroad somewhere and there was a, a crisis in power Zambia here. I think when you heard what the professor was saying, mm -hmm. the Minister of Education who was the chair was removed and I think they were looking for the next senior most female in, in, in education. But I wasn't senior most. I was, I think that I'm only deputy permanent secretary, but I was called by Power Nairobi and requested to salvage the situation in Zambia. So uh, as part of the work that Power was pushing for, it was the re-entry policy. So that was not my individual effort. I was part of the team that um, fought for girls to go back to school after getting pregnant. Because we realized that it was not their fault. In, many, in most of the cases, they were either raped, or they, were, they had no information. So why do you want to punish them twice by mm. then saying you can't, you can't continue with your education when they were just young girls who were being defiled and raped and uh, abused uh, left, right, and center? All right. I will request at this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, that we take a short commercial break. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> to our second segment of... Um, our interview with the most inspirational woman that I know. So uh, now, Barbara, I want uh, to talk to you about working with teams. So have you ever had to convince a team on an idea that they were not initially thrilled about? Um, yes, again, I have several examples, but I'll pick on one that have to do with um, the teaching of the local language. Um, in the early stages of, of, of school. You know, in Zambia, the medium of instruction is English. So we teach children in English from, from grade one. These are children who don't speak English in their homes. It is not their language of play. Um, but we, uh, the policy here is that we teach them to English as a medium of instruction. So Zambia began to introduce a teaching of local languages, I think, in the first two grades. In the rural areas, it worked well because in northern province, the local language is in Bemba, so they will teach them in Bemba for the first two years and then begin to graduate into English. I think eastern province also worked well because they started to, you know, it was phased. And it was phased, and then in, in the next province was, was, was eastern, and in southern province was fine because there was only one language. But then when it came to places like Lausanne, yeah. yeah. where yeah. They, everybody mm. speaks every language. Some yeah. teachers come from northern province, others from western, others from southern, we began the first problem. The teachers just said, I am lousy, and you have decided to teach Nyanja in Osaka. I don't speak Nyanja, so I'm not going to, to, teach, to teach that language. Others would say, yes, I am from this province, transfer from the, the, the mobility of teachers is just uh, it's, it's so high that teachers find themselves working in provinces where the language of, of choice of, of that particular province is not their language of, of work. So the teachers in the urban areas were almost protesting and they say, we're not going to do this. But then I thought, this is now about the children. Again, this issue of putting the children at the forefront. This is about the children. Let us be honest with ourselves. And you see, it succeeded so well in the provinces where it was, it was introduced. Parents began to request that they repeat their children, they bring their children from grade four to grade one or two so that they could be part of the primary reading program because the children in grade one and two could read so well that the parents felt, I mean, my, my girl is in grade four or five, she can't read, but her younger sister, who is only in grade two, is reading, because they were able to. So that was my thinking. If it is succeeding, if it's doing so well in this process, why they couldn't introduce, then we can introduce it. And we tried to persuade the teachers to sacrifice a little bit. I mean, I, and I know they were just being difficult, because in here in Saga, we all speak in here. Whether you come from Western, mm. Southern, or Northern, we all somehow speak them, because this is the language that uh, is, is common here in Osaka. But teacher just said, I'm not Nyanja, I'm not, that's how I'm not going to teach in this language. 
So we persuaded the teachers to come along and I mean, the resource centers were used to help teachers who couldn't use the language well. And in the end, we succeeded in having it um, accepted. It is a pity that it didn't continue eventually because the resources dried up and uh, it didn't really. But I'm, I'm still talking today about teachers who still use that number. I, I like the idea of resource centers because resource centers are modeled on peer support, isn't it? Yes. Where teachers support yes. each other to be able to do it. Yes. All right. Now I'm going to bring you a bit closer to home. So what do you think as young leaders we must do to achieve the high hopes we have for ourselves, each other, and for Africa? Mm. What must we do? I look back and think of the time when I was young myself. And what I aspired to do. And I think the biggest thing <coughs> that will help us as young people is to dream big. I know it's difficult, but if you, if you dream big and aim at achieving achieving your dream, nothing nothing will stop you from achieving <coughs> what you want to do. But also know that there are no shortcuts to anything. You have to work hard. You have to earn your promotion if you, you're in employment. You have to earn the, you know, the growth of your business if you, are, if you are in business, but you can only do that through hard work. And hard work also involves honesty, integrity, and I mean that. I want people to listen to me very carefully. What, what do we mean by integrity? We want to do things above board. We were talking about corruption this morning. Mm -hmm. And I was very happy with the answer that was, oh, that was given. We're not going to be part of anything that is un unethical. So you need to begin to think honestly. At this very age, if that's something that, that you don't qualify to get something, don't try and get it through elements. Everything should be done above, above board. And it's possible to do it. It is possible to do it. The ethics of all our nations are very, very clear. I mean, you, you, you're, you're an honest, you're a hard worker, you do things above board. People will notice, and people notice hard work. You don't have to show that you're working hard, but they will, they will see that you are, uh, you're working hard. So I think the biggest thing that you can do to get your goals is to set them high, strive to achieve them, and there is nothing to stop you from achieving them. Mm. But also just be yourself. Be yourself. Don't aspire to be what you earn or what somebody else is. That way you will be able to achieve your goals. Thank you so much. Did you hear that? Yes. You have to earn it. You have to be honest. Stay above board. Have integrity. Work hard. Most importantly, be yourself. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? I yes. hope you got to write that down, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question that started coming up you know, in the morning. How did you avoid this trap of being big-headed? Come on, at 28, you're already deputy head. The very teacher that was teaching you was still just a teacher, for lack of a better word. I'm not saying anything against teachers. I'm just trying to stress that even your own teacher was still just a teacher, and you were already deputy head. And you rose through the ranks. To, come on, you're sitting with all of us here. You've got the highest rank. You've achieved so much. How come you're not big-headed about it? You, didn't come here with your regalia. You don't insist on being called Ambassador Chilangwa. You don't insist on red carpet treatment. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is that I am not special. I'm just ordinary me. And I never really thought of being what I am not. If you just become yourself, don't look at what the next person is doing or what the next person owns or has. Mm. I think from the beginning you, you, you realize that um, you can rise to the highest position by just doing the right thing and doing it well. Do the right thing 
do it well and pretend to be who you are not. And people will notice. I mean, people know that I'm ambassador. They know that I'm happy. I don't have to tell them. I don't have to brag about about it because anybody anybody could have been ambassador, could have been, could have been PS. And I think that's what keeps me. I don't know whether to say humble because I don't think I'm You humble. are humble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yes, yeah. I don't like labels. I don't like. <laughs> yeah, anyway, well, we will abuse that label for now. But, but yeah, thank you so much. But, Barbara, what other mistakes or traps are common for leaders, particularly women leaders? We are all young people here. What are some of the traps that you have seen young women leaders fall into? People as they rise, as they find themselves in spaces that they didn't expect themselves to be. What are some of the traps? Yeah. Um, I think what the biggest trap that I notice is that people want to again to be what they aren't. You know, they want to do what, do what other people um, have become. I think that would be the biggest mistake that you can that you can make is to try to pretend to be what, 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 what you are not. And don't fall into the trap of wanting to fast track your, your, your life. There is, there is nothing like that. You have to uh, have patience. And patience pays and helps because then you are growing and moving at, uh, at, at the right pace. If there are no shortcuts, as I said the earlier, and things don't just happen. You, you can't just wake up one morning and become what you have not worked for and what you have not planned for. Don't think it will fall like manna from, uh, okay. from heaven. You have to prove yourself. You have to show that you, you can do the work. And as I said earlier, people, people will notice. So don't fall into the trap of one thing to do, to be what other people are. But also humble yourself. You know, don't say it is, it's, 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 it's me. It, 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 it's about me only. Because the person next sitting next to you may do the job even better. Mm -hmm. you, you, but you don't know them. But because they're not showing it, you think you are you are the best in the team or in the group. But in actual fact, there are people that can do the work better. So you have that patience, the respect for the work that others are doing, and appreciate. Um, your situation, if you happen to be in a situation um, which provides an opportunity for you to either rise or to get leadership. Uh, thanks so much for that. Um, talking about leadership and being trailblazers and pace setter and train setter, because you were the first deputy head, you were the first teacher at that school was Zambian, first deputy head, you know, all those positions that you've occupied. What is the burden that comes with being a trailblazer? like the first person to do something? I think expectation from people can be very high. I mean, they, they, well, you, you, you may go there boldly and say, I'm taking this up. But then the people that are watching are expecting you to do much, much more than you, you, you might even be capable of doing. Uh, but that should urge you on. The fact that you know people are expecting you to do better should, should urge you on to, to do to do even, uh, even better than you would have otherwise done. So I think for me it is it's that age that uh, should, should really help you to, to stand your ground. How have you dealt with feeling overwhelmed with those expectations? Um, or do you ever feel overwhelmed by them? Yes, 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 I do. I do feel overwhelmed. Um, and the way you deal with being overwhelmed is a being, I think being calm in a, situations because if you don't if you're not calm you might find yourself over overreacting mm -hmm. so I think it helps to take a, a deep breath be calm <laughs> and say I have to do this I may not have the time to do it well but I'll put in my best and I'll try as hard as I can to do this to the best of my ability I think I like that phrase do things with the best of your ability. That means you are putting in the best, and the result is usually rewarded. You'll find that you succeed in what you do. 
I'm going to ask you the last question for this segment of um, the interview, which focuses on the reason why we are all here the, at the regional meeting, which is strategic planning for the next phase of, of CAFED and CAMA. So as we plan for what we're going to do within the next five, 10 years, what criteria do you think we should think about, like three framework positions that we should approach this with, three things that we should not negotiate on, we should be the parameters or the boundaries. What three things would you say we should really put up front as we decide? Yeah. I think one of the most important things we should put up front is looking beyond karma. Mm -hmm. I think again, Professor had a very good message for us. We need to begin to see our work transcending into national agendas, into regional agendas. We are capable of doing that. And in fact, we have already started doing that. So I think let's begin to look beyond uh, beyond karma because the good work we do really belongs to the, to our countries. It's not it doesn't belong just within within comfort framework and within country. It belongs out there. We are there here to demonstrate good work and then uh, ensure that it is integrated into government systems, in government policies. Um, that way we will we'll, we'll have that feel that we are really making a contribution mm. at national level and at regional level. The other one I think is, I think quality assurance. I was listening throughout mm. this uh, meeting when people were talking about numbers. Numbers are very good, and we have good numbers, but we need to begin to look at controlling the quality of our membership. Mm -hmm. The fortunate thing is that we already have professionals in our midst, so mm -hmm. we want to professionalize karma, mm -hmm. to yes. benefit from yes. the cream that we have. All those engineers I'm hearing about, the IT specialists, the doctors, the lawyers, these are a resource the resource that we can utilize to help improve the quality of our membership. And I think um, we're capable of doing that, but when I say quality control, I'm not saying we discard anybody, we, we look down on others, because we are all valuable. We put value each other's contributions. We all have a role to play, contribution to make, but we also need to benefit from the wealth of Ensuring that again, what, what we benefited from is also spilling over uh, to the rest of the Kama, uh, the Kama leadership. The lady <coughs> was talking about vision for our nation, vision 2030. I think we all have the vision 2030. Mm -hmm. The AU has the vision 2063. Mm -hmm. And we also know what the strategies are for the AU for our country. Mm -hmm. There's now climate change as a focus. There's a, some of the, in this country, we're not focusing on agriculture when we're eliminating hunger and promoting nutrition, we need to be part of that growth, that strategic thinking in, 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 in our countries and, uh, and, and in the region. We need to be, uh, I think, new generation leaders. And um, I, I think, we, again, it was emphasized that all our countries are youthful. They are, the majority of the populations are just young people. For those demographic villages, Yes, yes. And here we are. We are just that cream, that cream of the, the under 30s that they are the, 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 the talking about. And we have a role to play. We are there to contribute to developing our country so that we become middle income countries, uh, so that they contribute to climate change, that we, we decide that that is a priority for your country. We are part of, uh, part of that agricultural uh, development. So I think for me, those are the three that I would like us to emphasize on as we plan for the next 10 years. 
Thank you so much. You heard that, right? Yes. Issue number one that we need to think about. What did she say is the issue number one we need to think about? We need to go beyond karma. The second thing is we need to professionalize karma, quality assurance. And the third thing is new generation leadership. All right. So thank you so much, Barbara, for this second segment of the interview. When we come back, we'll have an opportunity to get questions from the floor. May I ask you to write your questions? We are going to just randomly pick some of the questions that we get. Now we're going to have a short commercial break. Is it your toughness, no-nonsense nature, and smiling nature that has made you succeed? Mm. Oh, my goodness. A little bit of that, <laughs> but mostly just hard work. Just, just hard work and doing the best of whatever I am supposed to do and doing it to the best of my ability. Right. A little bit of toughness, that's the one thing. <laughs> okay. How do you deal with criticism? Because it, um, it sometimes can break someone's ego and self-esteem, more especially if you feel unappreciated. Yes, that is a very correct observation, and I've had a lot of a lot of criticism. I remember one teacher. I know sometimes I was a bit on the tough side. I would lock the gate after eight o'clock. People were late that time, and this teacher just came to confront me, you think <laughs> that being tough is what does the work. This is not your school. <laughs> this is a government school and we are not going to have this nonsense. Actually, just like that. I mean, this nonsense of you deciding, uh, I think, out of your emotions. And I said, unfortunately, I happen to be the head of this school and you will do as I say. If you don't, you can go and find a school elsewhere. And we became friends, friends after that. So it was tough at some point, but also realized that, oh, yes, people make mistakes. We are all human, and people get angry at, at people, and you just have to accommodate that aspect. And what, if you're a leader, you really should expect to be, uh, to be criticized. But it's the way you respond, that, uh, that will help to correct the situation. If you're too harsh and you refuse to accommodate the feelings of others, I think you'll have a problem. Do you ever feel you were unfairly criticized? And how did you deal with that? Yes, yes, I think in a lot of that used to happen again to me. Um, again, I like by giving examples that will explain the situations. I remember, in fact, the person who said, oh, you are bringing a Zambian to this school, you are destroying this school because the Zambians are lazy, you know, they don't work hard. And it was a politician, I think it was a governor that time, they used to call them peaceful governors. And I went to him and said, you, if this is your policy, you are the ones who have said you are to Zambianize for this position that you are being handled by, by expatriates. Yeah, I'm qualified for this job. They were looking for university graduates. I am a graduate. And I have earned this position. I mean, if you begin to treat me in this way, if you really uh, can speak like that about me, what do you expect others? others to say? So I thought that was a very unfair criticism, but I went and spoke to the, the, to, the, to the governor. I didn't go to confront him, I just went to go and make the point that I had found out that he had said this, and I felt that because I'm qualified, I had to be supported. I needed his support for me to. I'm so inspired. Have you ever had a situation where you met with a time that you had to make a decision and it didn't pass through? If yes, what was the feeling? How did you bounce back? Yes, many times. Many times you think what you, your suggestions are the best and then somebody comes uh, sometimes with, a, with better ideas. And I, and, and I have come across a lot of times when I have felt that what I thought was the correct situation was really not the correct because somebody else had, um, had, had a better idea. I think one example that I can think of is um, the, the school that I was teaching at, I think we had a situation where, um, I don't know, girls, 
use to get these hysterical hysteria attacks, mm -hmm. you know, and my view was this is nonsense, I'm not going to have this in my school. And then somebody said, we don't know the background of this, we don't know what's causing the hysteria, maybe it is the whole situation, so maybe we should listen to, because I, I thought it was happening so often, I thought they were pretending just to get at me, but we realized that actually the two girls that we were doing that they were coming from very difficult homes. The thing that there was abuse at home, there was hunger at home, and I think that was a way of them, I think, coping with those situations. So I think I realized that you need to not to react immediately, look at the circumstances that can cause these situations, and that's how we managed to deal with that. Um, was mama, does this address mama, was there any time in your professional life when you felt intimidated by a man or a man? So how did you deal with it? Yes, a lot of times I was intimidated by men who just came and told me, we don't know what you have done to make to get this position. We know, we know what you have done. I'm sure there's somebody up, up there behind there. You know, there were they were thinking that I was sleeping with men to get <laughs> to get the promotions. And yeah, we know what we've been doing, so we will make sure that we you don't succeed. Open it like that, because we know where you're coming from. How come? You have no experience, we've been working for a long time here, and there there you are. That's like coming from nowhere and coming to get all these Again, I say it well, as far as I'm concerned, I have not uh, paid anybody to promote me. I've just worked the hard. And I'll work hard for me to work hard, whether you like it or, whether you like it or not. And I don't care what you think. I will do my job, and I speak my job. Oh. How did you manage to settle in Angola, away from work, which you had passion for? That's the last question we had. I don't know if Mangala remembers. <laughs> <laughs> it was the day of fire where we pick up the doctors. I think we had to do it twice because the first day I just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't say goodbye because I didn't want to go. To be honest, I didn't want to go. But I was told in this position, if you refuse, <laughs> they would think, what does she think? She is, and then they might, it might even affect comfort work because they might think, what is it in comfort that can make a person if you turn down an appointment which so many people are craving to have. So I went to Angola, very reluctant, and it was difficult to say goodbye. But I knew I had to go because it was a national responsibility. Some people are saying, no, it's an honor. You're going, you're going to save your country. You're going to represent the president. Because that's what ambassadors do, actually. We are representing your president in, in another country. So in the end, I realized, yes, well, maybe I can take it up and go and, and try. It was a challenge because Angola is a very hot country. It's, the language is a problem. I had no motivation for learning Portuguese. <laughs> Because I knew not many countries use Portuguese, but I needed to, to know a little bit at least for, for me to communicate. So I was under pressure to learn to breathe, to go, learn to go shopping. Um, and uh, the other thing is, Angola has a lot of wealth. You know, it's a rich country, very rich, with very rich men, people, men, but the poverty levels, I'm telling you. It is worse than you see here. A poor Angolan is worse than a poor Zambian. Mm -hmm. And the townships, or the so-called shanty townships, are just plastic. Plastic, black plastic and cardboard, and they are much worse than our shanty townships here, because at least ours are a little bit of a semi-permanent structure. So that should, used to hurt me so much. And the situation for girls is terrible. If the girls are carrying a bed on their back, a dish of fish on their head, and the, the others are pregnant and are selling in the fish in the streets, and civil society is not even recognized. In fact, you could count the civil society organization by hand because there was no policy for civil society. 
and nobody listened to them. So I knew that there were these desperate situations with these girls who were not going to school. And this country had all the money to build new schools and to train teachers and to ensure that all these girls could be in school, but the money was going into the pockets of a few greedy individuals. So you can imagine the pain. So when my three years was up, I thought I would pack my bag and go, but no, <laughs> there was a fourth year. <laughs> I stayed an extra year. Uh, by default, I think, because I was ready to come back home after my three years. But that's how hard it was. So I couldn't wait to come back home. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've gone through all the questions that we had. I really want to thank you for doing this interview. I hope that it wasn't just me who felt really inspired by you. Is there anything else you might want to say to others in this room that I want to know? Um, I think the only thing I can say is that comfort is there's a magnet in, in comfort. It, it, you feel, you feel you want to belong all, all the time. And I hope you feel the same way too. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of the great work that Comfort does, uh, I think the great work that I'm beginning to see Kama doing, <coughs> I hope you are all being drawn. Maybe even if beyond beyond Comfort and beyond Kama, you begin to be drawn to the work, the kind of work that Comfort and Kama uh, are doing. That will, will make a big difference in our nations and in the continent as a whole. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. <laughs>